Okay, so we're ready to start. First of all, since I'm seeing people here who are not beginners, I have a question for those of you who have a lot of expertise in ImageLib too. What are you aiming at getting out of this? <laughs> what do you think I was going to say? Well, hi Albert, here's Arnim. Um, hey, I Arnim. hope to get out of this to see if I'm completely off with what I developed over the last, I don't know, 10 years of scripting, or if this is um, somehow along the lines what others doing as well, meaning not completely wrong. Okay, very good. Thank you, Arnim, and very nice to hear you. It's been quite a while. Indeed it was, yes. Jan, Jan Brocher, you have your hand up. Yeah, so, so actually, I mean, I'm also scripting for quite a long time already, but um, in programming, but um, Imclip 2 for me is a mystery, so it's perfectly fine. <laughs> this is, um... All right. Okay, yeah, because I had tailored this to really be very introductory, right? So this was not meant to be for advanced users. All right. Anybody else? I don't see. I don't see any more hands up. If anybody else want to see something, do please go ahead and say it now. There's Alex who says that I don't have experience on, of scripting, so they are all levels, I guess. Okay, thanks, Mark. All right, so let's get started. Now, before we get started, we need to get organized. Like I said, this is an introductory workshop to Python scripting in Fiji, centered in ImageLib2, to go into the guts of ImageLib2 from an easy, simple way. Um, everything I'm going to talk about is listed here in this web page, a Fiji scripting tutorial. There's a number of examples, particularly in the second half of this tutorial, that have to do with ImageLib2. So starting here, point 12, ImageLib2, Ryan Generic High Performance Imaging Processing Programs. If you have no experience at all with ImageLib2, I suggest after the workshop, clearly not right now, read starting here. And you get a bunch of examples and a, good, a few explanations on how ImageLib works, how can you access it, how can you use it to do image processing. And yes, those of you who are not yet muted, do please mute yourself if you can. Everybody should be unless you want to ask a question. So without further ado, let's stop the screen share and share dif um, let's share a different one. Um, but, um, we're going on to the script editor. All right. So this window is a bit too large. It's maybe a bit smaller. Okay, so the script editor in Fiji is what I'm going to be using to guide you through ImageLib2. Why do I do that? Um, if you ask the ImageLib2 developers, they'll tell you that, of course, you should be using this from Java, using uh, complex integrated development environment and IDE, such as Eclipse or IDEA or IntelliJ or whatever, the number of them. So I'm not using any of those. And the reason is that my approach has always been, can we keep things simple? So can we keep it within Fiji? And then within Fiji, can we keep it so that we can interact with the data rather than write a program, compile it, put it somewhere and then execute it. And so what I have here in the, in the Fiji script editor is the ability to interact with the data. So write programs, simple programs in various languages. I'm going to choose Jython just because I'm familiar with it. It's basically Python implemented for the JVM. The version of Python here is 2.7, which is a bit old. That is true, but that hopefully will change soon. So where do we start with ImageLib? Um, I think what, the very first thing we should do is demystify how, what is an ImageLib2 image, right? And then to do that, I'm going to start by creating it from scratch. And so what's a simple way to create an image? You can all see the screen, right? Nobody's complaining. Yes, good. Then how to do that? Um, I open the script editor. I'm going to simply open, um, let's hide this for now. Let's not get distracted. And I'm going to start typing. I'm going to say, I want to make create an image. And the, the most simple image you can possibly think of is an image that is backed by Java arrays, meaning arrays that are resident in memory, 
So as I start typing and I push control space, I get an expansion that tells me this. And by the way, I'm in Python, if you haven't done that yet. And so up here in the language, choose Python. So why do I choose array images? This is a class that contains a bunch of static methods that enable me to create images very simply. And now if I put a dot and say, I need to see the methods of this class, there we go. So let's create an image, for instance, how about and sign it shorts, the typical 16-bit image that you would use, something like this. And then it's asking me to put a, a long array as argument. JSON is such that whenever you have a long array or a list, it doesn't matter. You can put either. And so here we can create an image by simply opening brackets and saying, let's make a simple image that's going to be 512 by 512 pixels. Simple enough, right? That's it. I have now created an uh, image lib to image. It's as simple as that of a 16-bit type. I can write it in here. So the magic is all hidden away. It's the simplest thing that can possibly work. Now, can I see this image? There are two ways in which I can see this image. One of them is wrapping it. And so I'm going to type image A functions, and we're going to use the net image lib to one. And then here, I'm going to say show. And the show method will simply take as argument an image, which is I can even expand by putting control space when I'm typing image. And I choose that argument, which is one of the variables that exists. And that's it. If I now execute this, I will get a little black image, which you can't see because I'm not sharing the screen. I'm sharing only that window. Maybe we should solve that. Let me share the whole screen instead. Entire screen, yes, please. OK, there you go. Now you can see yourself in infinite loop. So maybe I'm going to hide this on the side. All right, here we are. That's a simple black image. It's a virtual image. You see there's a V, right? Now, this image, I'm going to tell you a bit about it. For instance, where is the data? How does this image store the data? Can I access the pixel array of this image? Um, yes, you can. And maybe you shouldn't, but you should know that you can. And so the pixel array will be image, um, I think it's called you know, update. I forgot that, but yeah, it's called update. We can give it null. And then this is the get, uh, oh god, what was that? I completely forgot. These are not the pixels. This is the access, the data access underlying that image. And so now for this access, we can ask, oh, ah, I don't know. What was it called? <laughs> he has this very long method to get the pixels. Sorry. And it's not expanding because it's null. I'm going to look this up in a moment. Sorry about this hiccup again. There's something to be said for having short names. Get, uh, no. oh, okay. How about here? Just went to the Java doc. I'm trying to find out what this is. OK, get corn, God Lord. So John Bogovich, if you're listening, we need a shorter method name for this. <laughs> that one. OK, I don't want to show the image again. But what I want to do is print this. So there we have the pixels printed in the screen in a completely crazy way. Can we clear that? Thank you. Right. Now, so the pixels are there. Now, what happens if you, if you have an image that you want to create from a bunch of pixels? So we can do, for example, let's import a way to create pixels from scratch. So from Jare, import zeros. And now we say our pixels in 16 bits will be the zeros 
uh, how many do we want? 512 by 512 and of type H, which means short. It means shorts. Now I have an array. How can I use this array to create an image leap to image? And instead of remembering this by heart, I'm going to go back here and try to remember. And the simplest way we can do this, <laughs> that's very detailed. We need to wrap it into a data access. Um, so we will need here um, short array, not of the side Java, not of image lib, that one. And then this short array will contain our pixels in 16 bit. That's simply a wrapper that we're gonna call access. With this access, you can now create an array image that contains it. Um, Sebastian pasted a link. Okay. So, right, with this, I can create an array image. And in particular, I need a constructor. So, this constructor now requires three things. One is the access object I just created. The second one is the dimensions that we want, which we said will be 512 by 512. And the third one is the fraction. Fraction is literally this class from the net image of two. There it is. And we're going to create one that has one entity per pixel. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. And then missing here as well is the fact that if you create an image from scratch yourself, you need to bind a type to it. And I'll explain in a moment what a type is, so it'll become a bit clearer. So I'm just going to copy this. And oh god, okay. So what am I putting in here? It's first, I need to expand this so it gets copied. And then, sorry, so they, I get the auto import every time I do control space. And then the second one is this enormous monster here, which is why you never want to type these things by hand unless you really need to. So what did we just do here? Well, what we've done is we've created something called an image lib to type. What is this type? This type is a convenient sort of deferral so that you don't access pixels directly, you access them via the type itself. So that the type has extremely fast access to the underlying data array in a way that then you remove all the overheads of having this level of indirection when accessing pixels in image lib two. So it, normally you will never need to even look at these things because like I said, you can create that image trivially like this. Um, if you want to, you can create it completely in your, um, in whatever way you want. The beautiful thing about this, of creating it whatever you want, is that you create your own access. This access is the short array that wraps the pixels. Again, a level of indirection for wrapping the pixels. Think of this quote, quote, as the image processor in the image way one sort of world, but not quite. This is simply a wrapper for the data, and that's that. It has no methods, yes, it cannot do nothing. It just knows how to access the data and how to do so fast. Um, the advantage of knowing this is remember that image lib2 is independent not just of type and dimensions, but also of storage. And therefore, this short array here is abstracting the storage to the underlying pixels, which means that you don't need to have an array holding those pixels. You could now create a new short array or a data access in general that doesn't even need to be an array of any kind. And therefore, you could have a function and generate data straight away from a function, say, uh, you know, two interfering sine waves that by, by x, y coordinate then give you a particular value. Or you could have then a completely abstracted, say, access to a remote server that fetches the data dynamically in a way that, that makes sense, you know, performance-wise and so on. This is the whole magic of ImageLib2 right here. The types 
and the access. If you don't understand these two, you'll have trouble understanding the rest of image lib. So just to recap, you have an image which is the high level access to it. How the pixels are accessed, we'll see in a moment, but it's via these types. And there are many types, one for each native data type, but also this could be even abstract types that you invent. And then second is the fact that this type is linked to the image in a very intimate way. So it knows how to iterate the underlying data, in this case, in the short array access, data access, so that it can do uh, so in high performance. This means you, know, you no longer have any overheads while at the same time, you're fully detached. Uh, so you, basically, you, you, have, you eat your cake you, and you keep it too. You have very fast access to the data as if it was a native array. At the same time, you also have very abstracted access so that you can have any kinds of algorithms that don't, are not even dependent on where the data is or how you access, or, or what type does it have. Right, so I stopped boring you with these details. Um, now let's look at one of these examples in which one can create data. I wrote it here already, but like I said, you can create your own access class. This access class, in this case, I'm extending a flow, I'm creating a class in Python that extends the float access. Float access is nothing else other than one of the basic type access that exists, but it's not bound to an array. All it says is, I will deliver, I will pro, I'm a provider of floating point values. And then as you see, this class is very simple. It has a constructor. It has a get value and a put value to write. I'm going to ignore the put value. We don't need it here for anything. So in Python, you say pass, and therefore you don't need it anymore. To get the values, all it, all it wants is what index are you calling the value on in this underlying data store? And then as a function of the width, you can compute the y. So you have the x, y coordinates, for instance, and then simply give it two sine waves. Right and show it. So why don't we run this code? I'm going to put this in a new window, paste it in here. If I run this, oops, dimensions is not defined. I have probably defined this somewhere else. Um, let's call this. So this is running, and now you see the image appeared. This image has no underlying data storage whatsoever. The pixels that you see in this image are generated on the fly. And the reason is down here, you can see that I've used the trick of creating an array image that I give it a particular access. This access, in this case, simply is a float access that generates values on the fly on demand. Of course, performance-wise, if you have to access the values over and over, it makes more sense to store them somewhere. But you don't need to. <clears throat> OK, number one. Everybody with me so far? Are there any questions about the type, about the access, and about how an image wraps around both of these things? Yes, somebody has a hand up. Can you please speak? Yeah, so, so I would have a, a question to to the access because you said like, um, so it's creating it on the fly, but that yeah. means like typically it's the same way like for a virtual image. So if I want to do pixel operations, a filtering or whatever, then it's is that possible in that case? Right, so what you have to realize is that once you have an image here at the bottom of the script, that is an array image. And you can do anything with it. You can process it further. You can copy it. You can view a fraction of it, run algorithms on it. It doesn't matter. All you need to be concerned about is performance-wise, are you going to be accessing the pixels a lot? And then do you care to, say, have this copied into an array or not? Or is it maybe fast enough to just generate it on the fly? That's the question you need to decide how you want this to be. OK. Thanks. So yeah. So for example, um, now that we have the image here, we can copy it. There are many ways to copy the image. Let's always start from the fastest, easiest. So let's create an array image that is going to be, you know, array images. Let's import this. Um, it has to be of the same type. Well, it doesn't have to be, but <laughs> okay, it would make sign. I don't want to expand for some reason. 
And find it short, I'm going to give it a dimensions the same as we had before. And now just copy it with the image util, which is like the fastest, simplest way to do this. So we copy our image into the array. Um, well, too many things to expand. Right. So now this image here, the array image would be simply a full in-memory copy in an array of the image we just created that is a dynamically generated image. Now you can visualize this image, do whatever you want with it. If you were to visualize this image like this, uh, basically this image now, so whoops, it's creating it. What happened now? What didn't you like? Generic short type. Oh, of course. Oh, good Lord. This was a float image. So it's telling me the type is wrong. There we go. Creating it again. So the array image itself, even though it shows as virtual, that's because we are wrapping it into an image A1 uh, sort of data structure, which is a virtual stack of a single slice. And this virtual stack then is pulling the data from the underlying image lib2, which exists in memory because it's an array image that is based on a, on a, a floats array, right? Whereas this one here on the left, this is the our out, you know, on the fly generated data. So there's going to be performance differences between these two images, but that's about as much as you should care. Again, if anybody has questions, you know, raise your hand. Happy to answer anything. So let's move on. Um, I have not yet touched much on the type, but I will try to do that later in the session. So the next thing I want to do is to tell you about views of an image. And for that, I'm going to follow here an example. And, and so what I'm doing in this example is first grabbing an image. And so I'm going to make sure that I have, say, this image here. And in particular, I want only this image. That's an A-B version of the sample embryo's image from image A. And now in this image that I can leave up here, maybe I can just leave it always on top. Um, what I want to show is let's execute this bit here. And let's do this persistent, by the way. Gosh. So when I say persistent, this means that now I end up having a repo in here. A repo, sorry. Repeat, evaluate, print loop. And therefore, whatever I execute stays in memory. And so what I can do, I can either execute it that way, like I did it just now by typing here, right? Or I can do it by selecting text and executing with Shift, Control, R, just that bit. So now if I go here, I can say print imp, and imp is the embryo's image, which I have just executed here on the left, right? So now I want to convert that into an image lib2. So more than convert, I just wrap it. And then what I want to do as well is I want to show it to demonstrate to you it is just there. So here it is. Now it has a V, meaning it's a virtual stack view of the underlying image lib2 image. Let's close that one. OK, so the next thing I want to do is, Im because image lib2 is completely detached from the source of the data, it doesn't really care what the underlying source is when it comes to iterating pixels, we can now do something crazy, such as, can we mirror this image? What do, what do I mean by mirror? I mean that instead of the image being defined only between, say, coordinates 0, 0 and width and height, instead of being defined within this interval, it can also be mirrored. So wherever you want to access the pixels, it will be there because, say, um, on the vertical y-axis, it will be mirrored, say, to the left or to the top, on the, on the x-axis on the top, the x-axis on the bottom. Maybe it's easier to simply do it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this extended view. This extended view by itself is, this is called a random accessible. It's not a random accessible interval. It's a random accessible, meaning this is a resource from which I can randomly access pixels anywhere I want in space. It doesn't matter. 
And then how it's gonna generate the pixels is by simply figuring out where in the space do you find what particular uh, pixel you need to pick is on the mirroring strategy that you're using or the extended strategy in general, which, which there are many. We'll touch that in a moment. So this is what I'm gonna do. First, we extend the view. Let's execute that. Then I'm gonna pick up the dimensions. Because now what I'm gonna do is create a bigger image. This is an actual now image rather than, so this is now what in the parlance would be called a uh, random accessible interval. Because this, is, this can be accessed anywhere, but it's actually only defined within a certain region in space. Beyond that is not defined. And if it's not defined, it's gonna throw an error because you cannot access pixels where it's not defined. So let's execute that. Now I have an extended image that is defined. So what it does is it basically calls views interval and says for that extended view that you defined before, whatever it is, in this case, it was mirror single. Um, now give me an interval. Uh, so these are the, the, the zero, zero coordinates in this case is like half an image on the negative side of things. So outside the domain of where the image itself is defined. And then I'm also making it so that the, the maximum coordinates are the width plus half the width. And to do this properly, this will have to be plus one. <laughs> but never mind. Or minus one, really. Is that right? Yeah, I would have to say minus one. So because you have to distinguish between what is the size of something, which is say the size is 412, and what is the maximum coordinate, which is because it goes from zero up to and not including, say, the width. Therefore, it will be minus one. And so now as we generate this extended image, and I show it, Okay, selecting like that. Here's our image. The dimensions are exactly double because we said half in either direction, right? So instead of 16, 000, uh, 1,600 pixels, it's 3,200 pixels. And as you can see, there are these symmetric patterns in there because of course, all we did is mirror the image, right? This is a strategy that comes in very handy for a number of algorithms that have problems, problems processing the boundaries of images. And, and this I can demonstrate trivially by going to Fiji and let's say, let's open one of the sample images like the, the blobs. And oh God, what is this now? Fiji is giving trouble to load the blobs image. You are kidding me. Um, okay, do I have the blobs image elsewhere? There's a bug inside. It's open, the it's open, Albert. It's open oh, on your left. Yep, thank you, I saw it right now. There's a bug that I reported earlier today on SciFew that I think is messing up all the remotely lowering images. Okay, so if I take these now and you want to run you know, some kind of blob detection system, it's gonna be very problematic with the edges, right? Um, because the, edge, the blobs that touch the edge you know, will have no, 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 no uh, let's put it this way, there's nothing defined beyond them. And therefore, if you want to define the boundary around the blob, there is no boundary. And so how could we solve this? is by making the image artificially bigger. And so one way in which we could do this is to say, um, I'm going now down here. Um, well, let's ignore this for a moment and say, you can do it, you can extend it in zeros, or you can extend it with a particular value that you want, or you can extend the image you want to have noise, white noise in this case. How would that look like? I'm just gonna show you one with white noise. Let's execute this and let's make sure this image is selected. Okay. Right. So now, now the boundary of the image is very obvious because we've basically said anything outside will be defined between zero and two, five, five. Um, if it was for some algorithms, this works from some algorithms, you want to have a mirror image for others. You want to have a particular value. So image that makes this trivial. And it does so not just for two-dimensional images, for n-dimensional images, a one-dimensional image, or three-dimensional, four-dimensional, it doesn't matter. You can always create mirroring of the data beyond the image boundaries. And therefore, you never have to worry about your programs having to special case any code near the edges. This simplifies tremendously writing any kind of code. <clears throat> so now, what, something else I want to uh, demonstrate with the views is Suppose you have an extended image, like, like the one we said before, 
on the embryos, right? Let's execute this. And so now you say, look, I want to acquire a particular uh, view somewhere extremely far away. Here's like 40,000 on the X axis and 60,000 on the Y axis, right? How will that look like? Well, I don't know, but here it is. Right? This is a thousand by a thousand pixels image. <clears throat> Actually, should have been minus one to be exactly perfect. So that's why the dimensions are wrong. 1001, 1001. Um, so it just picked up on this particular region, meaning the image is now defined randomly wherever you want. Am I hearing this another question? Nope. OK. Then, next up, I'm going to move on from views. There are many more views you can get. Like there are, you can get permutations to swap the axis on the x, y. You can get flipping of the image, you know, horizontal flipping, vertical flipping. This is all in the views. And by the way, this is a feature you should know about. If you select a class, yes, you can always, you know, go to the code itself and type views, push the dots, and it's, and if this wasn't failing. It will be showing you. Goodness. Okay, we'll leave that open. This, there it is. So now the views will show you all the methods that you have available. Um, the views let you do so much, from expanding borders to dropping singleton dimensions. This becomes very useful sometimes for removing dimensions that have a single, um, basically the width, and, the width and height or whatever of, of is just one. You can extend you can extend with mirror double, mirror single. This matters when you're doing Fourier transforms, whether you want to have the border to be repeated or not. You can extend periodically so that instead of mirroring, you just literally copy the image over and over in X and Y in every direction or Z. Extended by value, extended by zero, and then hyperslide. So you have a 3D stack. You can then obtain, say, you know, um, a two-dimensional slice in any in, in any orthographic direction that you want interpolating, which we'll see in a bit, and so on. There are really so much that is, is uh, sometimes you know, overwhelming. But that's uh, years and years of development of, of the ImageLib2 people, who Jon Bogovic included. So thanks so much, Jon. Um, John, uh, and so what you can do in there is fantastic. You can even subsample images. So you can pick every other pixel, and so on. Right. <laughs> but let's just stop here, because this, this is like maddening. There's so much power in there. But what you can do as well is select one of these words say views, this is a class, we can go to help and say look up class or package. And as you do that, this should have loaded a little window, which I'm not seeing. Hmm. Ah, there it is. It turns out there are many, many libraries in Fiji that contain the, uh, a class name, name views or that contains views. But the one we care about is right here, netimageslib2.view views. You can click on source, you can click on Javadoc. The source takes you to, to GitHub directly, so you can look at how the sausage is made. Otherwise, click on the Javadoc. The Javadoc will open Firefox in this case. And if I stop this being always on top, it takes you directly to the class views, and there are all the methods with all the documentation explained. So. Yes, somebody here was showing me a hand. Do you have a question? Nope. OK, no questions. Fine. Right, so this comes in very handy, obviously, to be able to reach out very quickly to documentation on any of the classes that you are using. So next up, are you sure there are no questions? It's all clear? Can you hear me, guys? Yes, I can. Good. Yes, yes. And, I, and okay. I can see myself also. Yes, I was surprised. <laughs> Everything was so quiet. Good. So next up, how else can I show you the internals of ImageLib? Um, let's see. We're going to go and do, Right, that's too basic. Transforms. Now, which is the other one I wanted to show you? Views. Well, we should probably go to this one now. Okay. 
how do we transform images in ImageLib2? Um, what I'm talking about here is how can we say rotate? How can we scale images? What can we do, right? So I'm going to show you now um, a little script that will take our image and rotate it. And I know that for some reason, this script wanted a three-dimensional image, even though it shouldn't have to. So I'm going to add a slice to that. Sorry about this, but I think I have to change something. Um, in any case, what are we doing? The basics. We can get an image from somewhere. In this case, I wrap the top image from image J. It doesn't matter. We can have loaded this from this. It doesn't matter. Now, I'm going to extend. I'm going to pretend that this image is in an infinite canvas made of zeros. So you use views extend zero. That's our extended quote quote image, a random accessible. Then now that I have this, that is infinite, right? We can say, okay, can we look at an interpolated view of that? And so as simple as pulling a non-linear you know, non interpolatory, uh, sorry, the linear interpolator factory. And then all you do is views, give me another view from this extended view, give me another view that is an interpolated view. And if this sounds like it will be a performance problem, it isn't, because ultimately that's exactly the same amount of mathematical operations as you would do if you were doing this in a tight loop over a pixel array. But it does so in an extremely convenient way, which is it gives you a view of a view of the data, which in this case, the data is also a view of an image plus <laughs> in image J, by the way. So then, then comes the typical mess of rotating images, right? You need to come up with a transform. In this case, I chose an affine transform because it gives me full flexibility to do whatever I want. And so I need an angle in radians. I need to define a center of translation. And so in this case, the, my affine transform 3D is called to center. I set a translation, meaning translate the whole image so that it's at zero, zero. So I have to transform it in, in the negative, right? Keep in mind that this is half. The CX and CY is the center, we need half of the width, half of the height. So we, trend, we simply shift the origin of transformation to be at the zero, zero. Then I do a rotation. And the rotation, of course, is now um, based on this. The rotation is another transform, by the way. To this transform, I pre-concatenate, meaning I do this matrix multiplication on the left, right? In which I say, OK, first shift to the center, now rotate along which axis? Well, 0 and 1 are the x and y. 2 is the z axis, the third dimension in this case, for the angle that we have defined here, which the angle is in degrees transformed to radians. So the angle itself is actually in radians. And then to the rotation, we pre-concatenate the inverse of the center. So remember, we had shifted the image, we rotated it, and now we shift it back to the center. And so with all that, that enchilada here is all you need to rotate the image relative to the center of the image. If you want to rotate relative to 0, 0, it would have been very easy because you don't need to do the shifting to the center and, and back. So now that you have that, there is a second kind of views, which is the real views. Why the image leave two developers separated views and real views is up for debate. It's very annoying, but as you can see here, is the net image to a real transform contains the real views. And I always abstract this as uh, alias, sorry, this as RV, because I cannot be bothered to type real views. Um, so this is real views transform. And you give it again this image R. What is image R? Is our, our interpolated view of the extended view of our actual image, right? And so, and then I give it the rotation transform. So it's just two arguments, your view and the rotation that you want to do. And then if we had not interpolated, this would look funny. And not only would it look funny, it would not have worked. And why it would not have worked is something fundamental, right? So image R is, oh, sorry, image R is a real random accessible, not a random accessible. This is something you need to separate in image lib too. Random accessible deals with integer coordinates. If you want to access pixels in space using basically something that is not integer coordinates, then you're going to need a real random accessible. And that's what the interpolator factory gives you, because it will interpolate between values. 
And this is, so a real random accessible is what you need for a transform because it will need to interpolate, basically it will need to come up with a, a weighted sum of the pixels at the right place, an interpolation of the pixels. And so now what happens is you have these rotated. What is rotated? Rotated is not really an image, it's an infinite image. It's basically a function in a way. It's one of these views again, that is simply a rotated view of the interpolated image. And so how do I now show that? I cannot just show it because it's infinite. This has no boundaries. You need to now define the interval where you want to see that transformation, that rotation. And so that's what we do here. We say views interval of my rotated view and the image. Why do I give it the image again? Because in ImageLib, there's the concept of interval. And all images are intervals because they are defined within a certain interval in space, in one, two, three, whatever dimensions you have. And so in this case, I could have given it a particular window of mean, mean and max coordinates like we were doing before. Or I can just give it the original image again to say, look, just show me that image. Meaning, show me, use that image as an interval. Bottom line, look, if I expand it here to make it a bit more clear, okay? If I'm gonna write this again, and I say, you know, IL wrap, sorry, instead of IL wrap, I'm gonna first type this views interval. And as I choose the interval, look at the Java doc. It tells me first I need a random accessible, and second I need an interval. If I go to the other interval method, it says, okay, instead of an interval, just give me the minimum coordinates and the maximum coordinates for each dimension in which you want to define an interval. This is essentially the same. And so instead, we can conveniently use this one. So here we can use the rotated. I push tab to go to the other one. And here we can use the image, right? Because the image itself is also an interval. So it just becomes convenient. So don't get confused. It's not that I'm giving it the image. I'm using the image as the interval within which I want to see the rotation. So remove this and show it. So why don't we run this code? So again, let's make this persistent so it remains here. And now let's select all of that. And let's run it and see what happens. Right, this rotated my image. So what you can see is that outside is all black because that's what we said it should be. Remember that? So if I don't want it to be black, we could have changed the extend zero to something else. Instead of extend zero, we could have said, you know, extend, what did, what did we want? For instance, extend value. And for value, I could have said, okay, here's my image and here is, I don't know, 50, for instance, something, or 120, it's in between in the gray range, right? So once again, I can select all of that and execute it with shift control R. And now we get a rotation in which the outside is gray. Because this outside is the part that we simply were making up, right? This, this data didn't exist. We just said, look, whenever you try to access a pixel outside the domain, the interval where the image is defined, then give it this value. That's all we've done. This is something that makes ImageLib so powerful, not having to care about boundaries of images at all, ever. So now, going forward, what I have in this script, which is also online in the Fiji uh, Python tutorial, is now a bunch of explanations on how to compute the transformed bounds. Because if you want this image now to be rotated so that it's fully contained within the minimal bounding box, you're gonna need to take, you need, you're gonna need to make to enlarge the canvas. How do you enlarge the canvas? It has nothing to do with image sleep. It's basically saying, okay, let's take the four corners. Let's apply the same rotation to those corners. So we rotate it. And once it's rotated, try to find out what's the minimum min and max basically of the coordinates of all four coordinates. So uh, of all four corners, so that I know how big to make the interval within which I want to define the rotation. That's what this code does. I'm not gonna go into it in detail. Like I said, this is in the Fiji tutorial as well. Right, so going back to the transformations, this is an affine transform. It can be anything you want. You can also have thin plate splines. You can also have simple translations or rigids or, you know, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, the full power is there for you to transform the image in any way you want. 
All you need to really understand is this upper part here, which is how to define what pixels will exist beyond where the image itself is properly defined. And second, how are we gonna interpolate between the pixels where the image is defined, which is the here the interpolation factory. So all of this could have been written more succinctly by saying views interpolate of views extend value, you know, and then you could have packed all it all together in a single line that would have that would have simply summarized all of this complex code for dealing with boundaries and dealing with interpolation. So you're free to not having to do any of that. Are there any further questions at this point? Nope. Everybody's very quiet. So, still in? Everybody's here? Oh, good. Thank you, Vladimir. Vladimir said it's great and it makes a lot of sense. Excellent. Okay. So, next. If there are no more questions on transformations, well, just to refer you again to this physical tutorial, which has a few, and I'm sure online there are plenty of examples from the ImageLib2 developers as well on transforming images. And always remember this distinction between, oops, sorry, this distinction between random accessibles and real random accessibles. The real random accessible really wants basically flooring point accuracy or, or for, for basically any being able to grab any pixel anywhere, whereas the random accessible cares about sort of integer sampling. Right, so that's, let's move on to the next one. So something else I find extremely powerful about ImageLib is the ability to use, um, the ability to not be limited by the dimensions of the data you can hold in RAM or the dimensions even of the length of pixel arrays in Java. So as you probably know, at the moment, at least in Java 8, you can only do pixels um, with uh, integer indexing and unfortunately sign integer. So this means instead of four gigabytes, you have two gigabytes only of data that you can have in a Java native array of shorts, of longs, of doubles, floats, bytes, whatever it is. And so yes, in, you know, 10 years ago, that was not a big deal. Nowadays, images are much, much larger than two gigabytes. And therefore that's, that's not possible. Also, you not always want to load all the data at once. So therefore, it makes a lot of sense to be able to express this in chunks. So how do you express things in chunks? Well, here's where we're now gonna talk on cells, cell grids, and the cached cell images. And why cached is because you want to be able to use as much RAM as you have available, but not more, while at the same time accessing, say, a one petabyte data set. And so here I've created a simple example in which first I'm gonna to explain to you how do we load each of these cells and second, how do we express um, these cells into a continuous image that you can use as if it was a small image that is fully contained in a single Java pixel array, right? So the first point to notice is we need to create a cache, an instant here, a cache loader. What is a cache loader? Here's called class loader. It implements this interface called cache loader that has a single method, get. What does it get? It gets an, at an index, it, it wants a cell, that's all. And so I need to give it a cell. And then, okay, in this one example, I'm gonna use to illustrate how the cell image works. You're all familiar with the virtual stack in image J. A virtual stack is nothing else than Wayne Rasman, you know, fabulous approach to overcoming the limitations in Java arrays. So what he thought is, okay, I can, I'm limited for a single image in a 2D plane of a slice of a stack to have two gigabytes, fine. How can I have many more in the Z plane? By simply having a list of pixel arrays, right? Every slice is one pixel array. So here, what we're gonna do is use every slice as a cell. We're gonna make a cell have dimensions of the full 
say, width and height. And in the Z, the cell will have dimensions one. There's just one slice of the stack. And so, but at the moment, that doesn't come into play yet. This loader, all it does is it loads, it, it, the constructor gives it a file path, a list of file paths and an access type. The access type will be, remember what the data access was? It's a wrapper over the pixels. And so in this case, I'm gonna use a short array, but we'll get into that. This class is completely generic, it doesn't care. And so all it does is add index, it'll say, okay, image A, give me that image at the index, just load it wherever you want. And here we have an image plus, right, IMP. At this point, we could filter the image, we could convert it from 16B to 8B to float to whatever you want, right? You could filter it, you can run you know, any kind of plugins on it if you want it, it doesn't matter. Once we are done with it, then we're gonna say, okay, the dimensions of the image is basically the width, the height, and one for the Z axis, right? So it's a, it's a list of three values. And then the position in which it will be in the overall cell image is simply the, at, for, for the dimension zero uh, width and height, it will be zero, zero, because the image fully occupies the domain in, in the, for width and height. But then in Z, it has dimension one, right? And that dimension is precisely the index that is uh, being requested. And so literally the cell position says, this is a slice at that index. A slice that takes the full x y uh, the full x y uh, axis, but only one single point in the z. And then remember that we pass as a parameter the class. You can pass classes around trivially in Python. And so this class now are instantiated with basically the pixels from the image processor of the image plus. That's all. And so now I return a cell which is has the cell dimensions, the cell position, and the axis. That's all the loader needs to do. It's a very simple thing that enables us to load things at a particular index and that's that. So now, um, in this case, I'm gonna, I write this little function, find file paths to find all the images in a directory recursively. So this uses a typical Python, you know, auth walk on a source directory. And so you end up with a sorted list of all the file paths that contain contained in that directory. And so here I took one of my test directories where I have a bunch of electromicroscopy images that I work with, I get all the file paths for that. And so the first thing I do is create a loader, which is the class we just defined for file paths and short array. These are gonna be 16 bit images. I could have even had the loader discover that from the images if you wanted to. But in this case, I know I, for uh, aiming at simplicity, let's just call it, I know they're 16 bit images, so I'm gonna use a short array for that. And then now importantly, I could have used this loader directly but this means every time that my virtual stack wanted to access that image, it would have loaded it from scratch from disk. Given that we have RAM, we can just use something from ImageLib that's called a soft ref loader cache. Cache, sorry. Um, and so this soft ref loader cache, all it is, is it takes soft references. If you're not familiar with this class, we can look at it briefly because it's important that you understand it. So I'm gonna select it, I'm gonna say help, you know, look up class or package for that selected text. Even though it's in a common, it doesn't matter, that's a valid class. And again, wow, it's in all kinds of places, but I want to go here, Java Lang ref soft reference. So I'm gonna click Javadoc. This brings up Firefox, and therefore here's our faithful Javadoc. So soft reference objects, right, are cleared at the discretion of the garbage collector in response to memory demand. What this means is, is a way of holding on to a list of things that you don't know if you can hold so many because you don't know how much RAM you have. But when the Java virtual machine says, look, I need space to allocate more things, it's just gonna throw them out. And then your cache, all it's gonna do is reload it when that happens, if, if it needs to access that image again. It's as simple as that. And so with one single line of code, we now have a perfect cache essentially for a virtual stack. Right, so what else do we need to make this cell image? Well, first I need to load the dimensions, which I, I don't know what they are. So I'm gonna use the cache itself to tell me like, can you give me the first image? So it's gonna be at index zero. So remember call get, here's our first image. And then <clears throat> this first, by the way, it's a, it's a cell. This, this is actually a cell that wraps, cell that wraps uh, the, uh, the short array for the image pixels. 
of the slice at index zero. Okay, just to have some more detail of what we're doing. So I get given that most objects in Image Sleep that hold data have are are, are basically uh, defined in the in Euclidean space. They have this dimension method that you can call to get you know what is the dimension at axis zero, axis one, etc. Right. So I get the width and height. The depth is simply the length of files that I have in my folder, and the assumption is that all files have the same dimensions. So if that wasn't true, and pixel type, by the way, if that wasn't true, remember, you could go to the loader here and enforce that to say, look, I need, a, I need to, you could make the canvas bigger, you can make the canvas smaller, you can crop it, you could create views of these things and then have you know, access to that view and so on. Like there's so much flexibility for handling images once you have this kind of setup. Right, so now we have the width, height, and depth. We can say, okay, these are the volume dimensions. So it's gonna be a list of three values, simple as that, right here. And then the cell dimensions is we're gonna, it's a full slice. So it's the width, the height, and then just one in the Z, like we were saying. So with these two, we can finally create a cell grid. And my cell grid, instead of having little cells everywhere, in this case, it has very flat cells. <laughs> Every flat cell is a whole slice of the virtual stack. And so all I need to give it is the volume dimensions and the cell dimensions, and that gives us our grid. Once we have our grid, here comes the mouthful that eventually, you know, excellent people like John Bogovich et al. will create a much simpler way of defining this because this is too verbose, essentially. But this creates now our cached image, which has four essential ingredients. One is the grid that says, where is the data? How is the structure, sorry. How is the data structure? This grid knows nothing about the data itself, just knows where to ask for data, right? And then what kind of data? We're giving it an unshorted short type. A 16, basically, that's the 16-bit handler for short pixels. And then where will the grid be asking for data is the cache loader. When it calls get, get zero, get one, get two, you know, for every slice in our virtual stack. And then finally, the last line is simply a bunch of flags to say, look, this consists of primitive, primitive type of the short kind. And we want this to be volatile because the data might disappear. Because remember, this is a soft reference, soft reference cache, right? And so with, with this incantation, where the only complicated bit is really the last one, and you can copy paste it and forget about it, suddenly you can open that image. So let's see. I'm going to run the whole file. There's nothing else here. So I say, I say execute this file, there it is. It's immediate because of course it only loaded the first one. This is like image A, right? And so now I, as I scroll through this, it's gonna take some time because it loads each one. But if I scroll back, it's immediate because they're all stored in the soft reference cache, right? So there it is. We have now reproduced essentially the image A virtual stack. And we've done so in a way that first, this is an image lib image. So there's so much more we can do with it now because all the libraries for algorithms and so on are, that are accessible with an image lib, they're all there. Second, this is an image lib image. So you can now acquire views on it. You can acquire transform views on it, transform and interpolated views on it, extended views on it, right? It doesn't matter. This is now an image that is like any other image lib image. They all follow the same interfaces, the same contracts. So it fits into everything else you know about image lib. This is just an image. It doesn't matter that the data is stored in a bunch of little you know, cubes in there and backed up by a soft reference cache and so on. These are all fancy things. Um, the next point I want to make is this image as well, you could, even though it's 16 bit, you could convert it and access it as 8 bits. You could access it as floats, again, as a view. There's something called the converters that will do on the fly conversion between the types. Um, how to do that is via the converters class. Another class that you should know about is that one. And then here, oh, it doesn't want to expand. Why right, it doesn't want to expand? I don't know. The tab expansion for Jython is something I created and it's not perfect. But this is a class that, again, we can select, help, look at cluster package. I really need a shortcut for that. And then, oh my god, there are lots. Here it is, the source. No, thank you. Let's look at the Java doc. 
um, the converters will allow us to look at this 16-bit data in any other type you would want. It has many more things. You can look at you know, RGB images as separate channels. You can look at separate channels as a single RGB image. You can look at it as a real. You can look at it I mean, instead of the integers, values, right? Or you could convert it so that it goes from one type to another. Um, it's, it's really very flexible and powerful what you can do with it. Right, the next one that you should know is, remember we've extracted the access, right, to every cell. And so here in this code, we are looking at every cell. And so if we're looking at every cell before we ever return it, meaning before even the soft reference cache ever sees it, it means this is like a filter on the loading of the image. And therefore, suppose you wanna adjust the contrast, you could do it here. Suppose you wanna change the type, you can also do it here. You want to change the dimensions, you can also do it here. Suppose the image is missing, you can just catch the exception. Okay, this image is, is none, right? And then you could return a black, a completely black image that is just a virtual image. It's simply basically an image that has no, no it's like a view of a black space that is, that is marked at an interval that is the interval that you want, right? So, this essentially, the way it's built, it enables you to cope with errors very simply. Errors in the data, errors in the storage, errors in the access. It's very permissive in that way. So this is the flexibility that you know, most of us were missing when dealing with, say, ImageJ proper. ImageJ works great when the, the conditions are perfect. If you're lowering the data now remotely from an online repository containing one petabyte of data, things will, you know, there's gonna be a 0.01% of images that will go wrong in some way, either because of data transfer problems, the network fail, or whatever it is. Now here you can cope because you have, again, a level of indirection onto which you can do something. And the beautiful thing about ImageLib 2 is that you do not pay a performance penalty for that level of indirection. It is built in such a way that you just don't. It's remarkable. That's the work of Stefan Pryby, Stefan Southwell, and many others, but these two really did like seven or eight iterations until they got it just right, and the overheads are essentially zero. This is, is a, the remarkable achievement and the foundation onto which the rest of ImageLib2 is, is built. So I've touched on most of the basic concepts I wanted to touch on today. The one concept I didn't touch on is cursors, cursors and random access. Maybe we should touch on that in a moment briefly, but do please tell me if there are any questions at this point. All of these scripts, by the way, are going to be very, if they're not yet already, they're gonna be in one of my GitHub repositories. Maybe I should just paste it. Basically under scripts, if you search for I2K uh, 2022, there's a folder that contains all of these scripts in that repository. Just to have a reference for what we've talked on today. No questions so far? Okay, no questions so far. Everybody here? The connection didn't fall down? No, you're live. Good. Man, it's so quiet. <laughs> I expected this to be more interactive. That's why I keep stopping. Maybe, maybe I have a question. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you for the workshop so far. It's very interesting. Um, you're most welcome. Um, you were just talking about cell images. And I had troubles to import large slide scanner data uh, into uh, an image lib2 script. Um, <clears throat> and I, yeah, I mean, um, you get the limitation of this, uh, what was it, a two, two gig of pixels yeah, or something? Yeah, two gigabyte, that's right. Yeah, and if, but if it is a size file, um, CZE I file, um, uh -huh. I mean, how can I import those? Because it's it's just one file. I, I cannot tell him to to buffer it in some way. He's always uh, then complaining that this file is just too large. 
That's a good question. So, I mean, there are several approaches. The simpler approach is in the loci bioformats package, which can parse all of these XI CSI files. Mm -hmm. There are ways in there to import it piecewise. And uh, like crop, yes. crop on import or something like that? Um, yes, but also even at the moment, I'm sure Curtis Rudin and colleagues, you know, have implemented a way to load that file as a cell image. Huh. So that so that then it will then kind of memory map bits of it onto the file itself. Um, I don't know exactly where it is right now, but I'm pretty sure that exists. I've seen it before. Okay. So yeah, instead of loading the file fully, just load it through a function that says, you know, read things piecewise so as, and load them as, you, as on demand, essentially. All right. Yep. We can try to find it later, but I'm, I'm not sure I would, it would take me quite some time now, but that's a question for the forum. And then if you- Yeah, yeah, the forum, uh, yeah, I will yeah. search the forum and if I'm not uh, finding it, I will, <laughs> I will just ask. Yeah, just ask and say, Curtis, come on, where is the cell image loading for the CZI files, right? And, and he like, here it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> on top of his head. Good. Yeah, no, Thanks. these guys are excellent. Yeah, sure. You're welcome. So that's one way. The other way is, I mean, the CZI, unfortunately, is likely compressed. So um, if it was a TIFF image, a multi-TIFF, a multi-image, a multi-section TIFF image, the TIFF format is easy to read and parse. And one can simply get the offsets to where the, all the pixels are and how large each one is. And therefore, you could then create a cell image where the data access, the index will be simply looking at the indices of that. And I could show you an example of that because I have it here. So if you go into, let me see. I think it's right here. So. In that library that I posted, there's an io.py that contains a bunch of functions that I use often. For instance, for a multi tiff file, I, I simply parse the header, which is trivial. It's another function that does it here. And what you see, this is a cache loader. You can see my screen, right? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, so that's a cache loader. And then what it does at every index, it asks for that, where is the, that particular image? And then using a random access file, it loads that image, it seeks, it moves basically the pixel pointer to exactly that place, and it reads the plane. It's, it's really, you know, read TIFF plane, it takes a random access and, and simply, basically what it does is it reads a tiny bit of the whole massive multi TIFF plane image. And, and so then that's, in that cache loader is built in such a way that it returns you as well, if you want a lazy cache shell image, and then you're expressing a virtual stack that is that relies on a single multi tiff file. It's, it's, it's pretty much the exact same thing with it so far, but in this case for a file format that I know how to parse, if the CZI had an obvious way of, of again, inquiring into the header, which the bioformats I'm sure provides, then you could also do it in this low level way in which you simply load bits of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then the next one to, to think about is if every single plane is larger than two gigabytes, you can then memory map it so that you only load cells that are up to two gigabytes, right? And then you partition the plane into multiple chunks. And um, this, this then will depend on how you define your cell grid. You could have more than one little cell per plane. And then imagine you have four, for instance, one, two, three, four. So the indices then will not be one per slice, it will be four of them continuous. So zero, one, two, three will be the first slice, you know, four, five, six, seven will be the second slice and so on. And in that way, you could again, abstract access to this very, very large image. Yeah, I will definitely try this. Okay, good. So now um, let's look at more things. I want to, was that? Yeah, that was an example we were using earlier. So let's use a much simpler version. Okay, let's, let's start from scratch. So again, IJ, give, give me an image, an image A functions, you know, wrap it, wrap that thing into a basic an image slip, image. That's just a simple way to create an image. And then now here, there are two more low level details that you should know about image slip. 
So one is the random access and the other one is the cursor. So what these two do is give you access to the underlying pixels. Random access, as the name says, you tell it where you want it and, and then it will just return you that. And for that, you need to give it coordinates. So let's, let's do that. Um, we're gonna need an array. So I'm gonna go here and say from Jare import zero. So this is a way for JavaScript for, sorry, for Jason to create native arrays. So, you know, our, my, my position array would be, you know, two and of type long, okay. L for long. Because all the, given that we're not limited by indexing array, but we are limited immensely by long arrays, which is absurdly large. I guess someday we'll have to be limited by big integer or something, but <laughs> I don't think we need that anytime soon. <clears throat> so now this is by longs. Um, what did I want to do? So, suppose we take an arbitrary position. So my X will be, I don't know, let's call it 128. And my Y will be 200 or something like that. And so now from any image, we can get a random access, right? And this random access image, we can say random access, like that. And then we say ra set position at position. And then we print this ra get. And this ra get returns the, in this case, depending on the image, returns the type, which could be, you know, for example, the unsigned, oops, sorry, unsigned uh, by type or whatever it is, or short type. So suppose we select, I don't know, this image here. This image has three dimensions. So, sorry, I'm gonna need this to be a three. Right, so position two will be, how many stacks do we have? There are 71. So this can be, I don't know, 50, from section 50, right? So let's see what happens if I lift this now, always on top. Let's make it a bit smaller. If we just somewhere there, let's execute this script. It's taking its time. Mm, what's going on? Wow. Okay, I don't know why is it taking so long, but this should have been essentially immediate. Oh, here it is. I don't know why it took so long. Something about Java and RAM, but here it just printed the value, 14,978. And then this is the pixel value at that position, right? So you can you could arbitrarily iterate any image with random access, but that's not the point. I'm just trying to tell you how can you access any pixel anywhere, right? If you want to access pixels continuously, say do a for loop over all the positions, that's when you use a cursor. So here we do you know image lib cursor, and then um, if I were to print everything that this cursor will print, it would start at 0, 0, 0 and go all the way to 2048 by 2048, sorry, 2047, the last coordinate, 2047, last coordinate in the y-axis, and 70 for the last coordinate in the z-axis. So I'm not going to do that, but essentially if you want to iterate, you know, two images and, and copy one pixel onto the other at the, some low level, that's what you would use assuming both images have the same iteration type. And that's, that's, another, that's when the conflict comes in, which is you need to find out whether, the, whether they are compatible. Um, how to do this? I forgot it on top of my head, but just something you should know. Not all images are compatible to be iterated um, in a way that makes sense. For instance, one of them could be a cell image where you know, every little fraction of the image is just one cell like this. And then what the cursor does is the optimal thing, which is it will iterate first one full cell and then go to the cell next to it and iterate the next cell over and so on. And therefore, if you're trying to compare pixel by pixel with a, with a different image that 
the cells were a different size, like this one where the cell is the whole slice, then it would not be, the positions of the pixels would not be comparable. So you will be doing basically, you know, something wrong. Um, that's why you have, always have to be aware of what is the iteration type of every image. And there is a way to ask for this in intervals or in utils, but I forgot. We'll find out somewhere. So, right, there's, there is a question that we should answer. I know it's not urgent, Jan, but now is the time. How do you make imports happen automatically? Um, okay, so if you do, basically, if, if in the recently most updated Fiji, control space would do it. The auto import, you should not use that because it would try to load basically a lot of TrackEM and ImageJ classes, which is too much. But control space is what it does. So if you want me to demonstrate again, um, here, can we get this to work, please? By the way, it's not the most robust thing ever. I don't understand why sometimes it doesn't work. But suppose you want to create an image plus, you start typing this, and here it is. Oh, one sec. I need to switch this on. OK. So all I've done here is push control space. And then as I start typing, it refined better. And now look what's going to happen at the top in the import when I push Enter on this image plus as selected, which is that it automatically added the import in there. If this is not working for you, it means Fiji is not up to date because it, it should be working. The, I have the newest Fiji, but um, it's uh, it's the, the auto completion works. Uh, okay. The only thing is the imports on top don't work. That's very surprising. But never so mind. It's I, not important now. So we can. No, yeah, sure. Forum. But <laughs> that is for the forum, and then we can revisit it and, and try to understand, you know, what's what's happening because it's working for me. So. I'll have to see what's going on. Um, Tiago Ferreira is also quite involved in these. So if I don't answer, maybe he will as well in the forum. Right, so regarding cursors. Um, John, are you still here with us? John Bogovic? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, John, I have a question. I have forgotten completely how to compare whether two images are compatible when you iterate the, the, via cursors. I think it's iteration type. I will check right now. My data completion. Why is data completion so flicky, finicky? Albert, are you sure yes. your computer is charging? Yeah, it is now. Don't worry. Okay. I know. it's. It wasn't until now, which is unfortunate. I thought it was. But uh, the UK plugs have that little flick that, you know, switch. It gets me every time. So this must be in the utils somewhere of ImageLib. And so if we go here to the frames, But I don't know. It's not under util. It's in the chat, Albert. Okay. Ah, oh, iteration order equals. Thank you, John, very much. Thanks so much. Right. So essentially, if you have two images, like this is one image. Let's let's uh, create a second one. Let's do this, you know, array images, um, I don't know, shorts, or rather floats. Again, just an image. And the image should be, ha, huh, should have the same dimensions as the other one. Otherwise, it for sure will not be compatible. Okay, I created the second image that has the same dimension as the other one. And so now, as we we want to print whether image iteration order equals goodness, that's very barbarous. Image to what is it? Iteration order as well. Yeah. Right. 
right? So if we take all of that and we execute it, why does it take so long to run? Okay, yeah, my computer is in trouble right now for some reason. Yes, indeed, John, we could for sure have a briefer way of <laughs> expressing this. I would, I would call it something like image.compatible. And then you give it another image and see whether two are compatible, which would essentially mean it's the same iteration order, and it's same, which means same dimensions. So look, this is giving me false, which is funny. And the reason it's giving me false is because when I wrap the image with image a functions, it uses a cell image to wrap a stack. And the cell image then is giving it a different basic iteration order than an array image, even though these two images are identical. So this is in a way of an incorrect false. So how I would go around this is instead of wrapping the image with image a functions, right? You would need to get the pixels. So this would be, you know, the imp get uh, get processor, get pixels, and now uh, create the image using array images. And this has the, 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 the unsigned shorts and take short array which is our pixels. And then what is the long? I think that's the dimensions. So the dimensions would have to be the same as this. Right, so let's copy this and call it dimensions. So that's yet another way of creating an array image that is very fast. You steal the pixels from an image image, and now you wrap it in there. This, will, of course, will only work if that image is a 16-bit image. So I'm going to make sure I have a 16-bit image selected. This is 8-bit. Um, this one is 16-bit, isn't it? Um, yes. And this will now do it for the only for the first slice. Mm -hmm. OK, let's just do it in 8-bit. So that's going to be in science. Right. Right. So even though this is float, it doesn't matter. Now I expect this to now be compatible. It's as true immediately. Okay. So see what happened. You know, gave us gave us a uh, false false <laughs> because the wrap is a cell image, even if it has a single slice. This is unfortunate, but that's that's how the wrapper works. Works. So for this to work, you need to get that, right? Iterate, iteration order. And so now how would you copy one image onto the other is if we go down here, we would do, okay, that's one cursor. That's a, the second cursor will be the other image, right? And now you basically have to iterate both cursors. So one simple way to do this is, well, there are many ways, but Cursors are also iterable in themselves. So you could do, you know, for type every pixel, but it's actually a pixel type in the cursor. Um, then the cursor to next, you know, set actually um, set float. T get. That that should work, and so if we now were to j functions show our second image, it should show that image copied. I didn't write it because it's not called set float. Oh come on! See, I forgot. So I'm gonna go here. Float type. And in principle, I should be able to express this. Yes, that one. What is it called? Adds, puts, sets. 
Ah, said real. There you go. Gosh, it's been a while since I've used this low level stuff. I almost never do. Said real, and this must be get real. Get real floats, probably. It's copying, it's copying in Jython, which takes forever, which is the real problem, which is why in Jython, one should never really do these things. So here we have a 32-bit image, which is the exact copy of the other one, right? So remember, to copy at low-level cursors, what we had to do is first make sure you wrap not by using image functions wrap, which is the easy way, but wrapping by stealing the pixels and putting them directly into an array image, because then for sure we're compatible. Then make sure you check that it is compatible so you're not doing something wrong. If you knew it's compatible, even if this gives you false, you could still iterate both cursors and be fine, right? But it's better if you're write, writing generic code that you check that the iteration order is compatible. And then finally, you know, to copy, you do this and that's fine. But keep in mind that a much, much faster way to copy is to do image util. You do copy and now you say image, image two, and then you're done. And this copies it using the loop builder, which will do it probably even multi-threaded in parallel and in native Java, and it's like instantaneous. So if instead of doing all this copying in here, which takes such a long time, and we were instead to use this system. Oops, now we didn't like something. Ah, oh, okay. These images may have to be compatible in a different way. Let's not touch on that now. What kind of error is this? Oh, sorry. I didn't. I had the wrong image selected. What's failing is up here, because obviously it wants an eight-bit image, and I was giving it the copy, which was thirty-two bit. So, okay. Let's put this image on top, which is eight bit, and now I come here and run this thing. Okay. Now we're getting a different error which is that unsigned by type cannot be cast to float type. Right, now what it's complaining about is when it's trying to copy is that these images are of different type. So here's where you will need converters and so on. Let's not go into that now. <laughs> but the fast way to do it is via the high level image slip framework it needs converters. So basically go to the converters, static, and then you know do the right thing. Um, whoops, didn't want to do that. Okay, any further question? This low level is not very suited for Jython. I really want to discourage you from trying to do any such low level cursor or random access unless for very few small amounts of pixels from Jython itself. If you want to do low level from Jython, you have two options. One is you write a Java program elsewhere and you call it from Jython, or you embed a Java program within Jython using the, the Weber, it's like a class called like this, that basically enables you to simply, it's like the, the Pyrex framework in SciPy for, for C Python, in which you can embed basically C code directly within Python, simply quote it and then execute it that way. Or you can call the closure interpreter directly from Jython itself and just run that. There are limitations to Jython that one cannot overcome, at least not trivially. So moving on. Um, I've touched on views, how to create an image, how to create an image in many ways, even virtually from functions, how to acquire views of an image, how to transform an image, how to then express, say, a folder of images as a cell image, right, which is just uh, showcasing how to have images much larger than what would fit in RAM or what would fit in a two gigabyte array. And then I've went also into touching a little bit onto the low level, how you iterate individual pixels, how you access individual pixels. There's really a lot more to say about this, but for the purpose of a beginner intermediate tutorial, I think this is plenty to get you started. So are there any final questions to this tutorial? Anything else you wanted to know that it would take you otherwise a lot of Googling to find out? Uh, I have another question. Um, Go ahead. Unfortunately, I'm too stupid to find the way how to raise my hand here. <laughs> That's all right. I kill it, I kill it find the raise hand symbol. Um, 
Uh, the first question is, you just said that you wouldn't use Jiten to do low-level stuff. Uh, is it the same problem with JavaScript or is it okay there? Um, JavaScript is less bad. It somehow gets interpreted in a way that also the, the, the just-in-time compiler can do it. But if you run a test, you know, write a tiny program in Java, run a tiny program in JavaScript, there is a cost you're paying. But okay. JSON is notoriously bad. You know, anything that has to do with float, with basically um, uh, loops, anything that has to do with loops will be pretty bad. Okay. And, and my yeah. second question is, um, let's just say I, I have a problem that I have to solve and I, I already know how to solve it in an abstract way. So I don't know. Mm, let's say I have to do some Fourier transform on an image and then I do something with a spectrum and then go back with the inverse transformation, for example. And I already mm -hmm. know that this could be my solution. What is the fastest way for someone who is not that um, like used to ImageLib2? What is the fastest way to find out how to do it? I mean, uh, in, the, in the past, if when I used the legacy uh, functions, I just used the record function of ImageJ and then I got a, sure. a kind of a, a bad script, but a running script somehow. Uh, what is the fastest way in ImageLib2? That's a good question. And I would say per use the, the ImageLib2 dash algorithms uh, GitHub repository and have a look because there's so much there. But so from here, what you could do is type FFT and have a look, right? Here's the IJ plugin, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is a way that net, here, net ImageLib2 algorithm FFT2, you know, import FFT. That's probably the one we want. And so now here we say, okay, what's in there? Here's the complex to complex forwards, you know, complex to real. It's all there. And here it says defined in, and you have a link that you can click, right? And so some of these will be what you want. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't know which is the one you want, but there's, th that's a place to start essentially. Okay. So suppose we go here, I click in this, button, this should now go to Firefox, and it puts me in the Java doc for FFT, right? It says compute FFT transform, either real to complex, complex to complex, or complex to real for an entire data set. Unfortunately, support, there's some limitations are listed here, fine. Um, and then basically you have the methods in there. So I would say the fastest way is simply type whatever you want in the script editor and push control spacebar and see what comes up and have a look. It's, it's, Cause really there's a lot. And, and so as you will see what it asks you for is maybe a random accessible interval, which is the data. The random accessible interval is the, the long winded way of image leap to say image. <laughs> it, means, it means it's an image that is limited within a certain interval and you, can ha you have random access to pixels within that interval. There's also something called iter iterable interval, but many images are both iterable intervals and random accessible intervals anyway. But iterable intervals when you have cursors, random accessible intervals when you use a random access. Um, it's, a, it's a detail you should know, but it doesn't matter very much for most purposes. So for FFT, I would start here. And, right. and then if you cannot figure it out from this documentation, you can always look at the source code and see how it's done. And the, it's all in GitHub, right? So Reading the, reading the source code of ImageLib is mostly how I navigate ImageLib myself. I don't really ever look at Javadoc. I just read the source code directly. I want to always know the details. And, and again, from the script editor, select these words, go to help, look at class or package. And then in a moment, it'll put a list of all the classes that pattern match with the three letters FFT. I see there are clearly many. Um, it's taking a long time. I think, uh, thanks so far for the, for answering the question. Sure. Okay. Um, anything else? Ooh, there it is. Oh my God. There's so many classes with FFT in the name. This is spectacular, but see, you found them all and you have a source button for pretty much all of them. Otherwise the Java doc or the search, which I'm not sure what it will do. Maybe we'll search in Google or something for that. 
but yeah, that's that's a way to enter it, right? So that you have a directed way to access the classes you don't know. Yes, thank you, John, for mentioning the URL to the forum. Many of us go into the forum. If you can, if you can put a, you know, the the email sign and call us in the same way you would in Twitter or other social media, and then basically we get a message. We get notified that you're asking a question that relates to something we may be able to answer. So for anything related to the script editor, I would appreciate if you do that for my name, which is A Cardona, just like that. I post it now. And then for John Bogovic, well, it I'm not sure which one you have, but it's easy to find because as you start typing the name, it will also give you a list of possible names to match. So then uh, Meng Yu Lin, you were saying, there's just so much in Image Leap 2, right? That it's hard to get in. Um, there really is a lot, but that's also one you should look at a few examples, like the ones I've posted here. And in particular, the everything that I've posted today, like I said, would will be in my own lab repository. So I'm gonna go to it right now live. So it becomes part of this video. And let's see, this is gonna be in Python, image J, and then it's under examples, IK2022, there it is. So here there are basically the four major scripts that we've used. And that's about it. So yes, I know many of you have to leave on to the next session. So unless there are any pressing questions, remember you can always ask them in the forum. You can also shoot me an email, but I'd rather you put it in the forum instead. And otherwise, well, great pleasure to present ImageLib2 to all of you. And I hope it becomes a very profitable part of your toolkit. All the best.